have you here with us today. First of all, tell us a little bit about your, your laboratory and your clinical work. Sure. So I'm um, uh, a professor of ophthalmology at uh, the Wilmer Institute, Johns Hopkins uh, University. Um, I, uh, my career is where I do both uh, clinical work and uh, laboratory work. My lab focuses on um, mechanisms of uh, age-related macular degeneration. We have two main uh, directions that we go. The first is in studying um, how oxidative stress uh, damages the retinal pigment epithelial cells, which the RPE cells are a central cell type uh, involved in age-related macular degeneration. And the second project is uh, projects are looking at how oxidative stress magnifies the innate immune response and ultimately damages the retinal pigment epithelium, which then subsequently leads to uh, the disease. What are you pursuing in terms of the oxidative stress hypothesis? So um, we started by um, looking at um, prominent histopathological features and epidemiologic features. And um, I became interested in the retinal pigment epithelium because of the profound changes that you see on uh, histopathology. Uh, we became interested in the role of cigarette smoking, which is a, a strong chemical oxidant. It carries 5,000 toxins in, in each puff of smoke. And uh, uh, so we wanted to, since cigarette smoking is one of the most uh, prominent uh, risk factors for AMD, it's modifiable and reversible if people stop smoking, we thought it would be a good platform to study. We become interested in the NRF2 signaling pathway because NRF2 is a transcription factor which controls uh, a large uh, assortment of uh, antioxidant genes. So our hy hypothesis that we've been per um, pursuing has been that chronic oxidative stress um, elicits uh, an appropriate NRF2 response, but over a period of time that response fails, the RPE cell gets in trouble and disease uh, uh, manifests. What are the translational implications of your work? So there are um, a number of, um, of NRF2 uh, rejuvenation medicines, in other words, uh, drugs that can uh, increase the production of NRF2. Um, and uh, which uh, some have been in clinical trial shown to be safe. So the idea would be that if you can rejuvenate the NRF2 signaling system, you can prevent oxidative damage to the retinal pigment epithelium and slow down the process of disease. We think that oxidative stress is, um, plays a, uh, an early role in disease manifestation. So if we can um, circumvent some of the oxidative damage early, that will slow down the progression. And uh, in, in our opinion, slowing down the disease uh, is all that's necessary. Because if you can prevent people from going blind uh, by 10 years, um, just the natural history of people's lives, they'll, um, they'll um, uh, preserve, have good vision for a, a long period of time. This pathway modification will be accomplished by a small molecule approach. Uh, how, how will it be delivered? Yeah, there's a number of small molecules uh, which are known to um, activate NRF2. Um, and so NRF2 works, uh, it's held in the cytoplasm by a molecule KEEP1. And upon um, increase in electrophiles or oxygen free radicals, there's a conformational change in NRF2. And that, re or, excuse me, in KEEP1, that releases NRF2 to go to the nucleus to begin um, its transcriptional program. So some of the small molecules can enhance the release of NRF2 to transit to the uh, nucleus to, uh, uh, to begin uh, its transcriptional program. What are your next steps? Well, um, in, in our models, we uh, have a model system where we expose mice to cigarette smoke uh, over six months and we get an RPE degeneration. We have uh, found that that's not sufficient to develop um, all of the features of AMD that we want in the retinal pigment epithelium. So what we've done is we've looked at other risk factors for AMD that are modifiable uh, and we've uh, focused on high fat diet. Uh, because again, uh, theoretically, someone could change their diet and improve, uh, reduce the risk of developing AMD. So we've uh, taken mice which um, simulate um, um, fat metabolism 
uh, that's similar to humans, and we've exposed them to cigarette smoke, we've exposed them to high-fat diets or the combination of both. When they're exposed just to a high-fat diet, they don't develop uh, a severe AMD phenotype, but when they're exposed to cigarette smoking and um, a high-fat diet, they develop fairly severe manifestations, including uh, a uh, phenotype that looks like geographic atrophy, which is a late-stage form of the disease. When we've looked at why that occurs, we see, as we had seen before, we see the NRF2 signaling pathway become impaired um, and the, um, the cells are prone to oxidative damage. But we also, when we investigated why the NRF2 s system uh, becomes impaired, we found that GSK3 beta uh, is increased, and GSK3 beta is known to phosphorylate NRF2, which promotes its degradation. When we, since GSK3 beta is connected to the Wnt signaling pathway, we then pursued and studied the Wnt signaling pathway, and lo and behold, we found that that uh, pathway was also suppressed. Since Wnt is a, uh, a very prominent cytoprotective pathway, we uh, feel that um, the decline in uh, two pathways is uh, necessary to get the, the more extreme circumstance where the cells actually die. So they lose enough capacity to defend themselves against these insults. So ultimately you, you have a dual therapeutic approach? Uh, potentially, yes. So uh, I, I think the model would be similar to the success that you get in chemotherapy uh, for cancer. Um, one, because um, these uh, signaling pathways are redundant, uh, I think um, you need probably multiple targets to be able to, to, uh, to, uh, to recover. Fascinating work. Uh, we look forward to seeing the results as you go forward in this.